Okay, um, I got a call from Ada and inviting me to um, exhibit here a piece and um, at the Banca Art Center, and that I got to meet um, TJ, who's just brilliant. And so the show was collaborative, and uh, Jose and I have known each other forever. We worked together at the Art Institute and the Foundation Department. And so uh, I was working on a series of drawings, but once they invaded the U Ukraine, I began to take these kind of drawings that have a lot of these elements, but they weren't. And, and I began to think about Anselm Kiefer's work that pushes way, way back deep. And so I went out in a snowstorm, laid down on the ground, and took photographs with my little camera of my tire tracks. And um, that became the backward spatiality of the of these pieces, and it and it began to me to represent the invading of something, the, the pushing through. And um, so I I wasn't sure who I was going to have. I, I kind of I, we we talked a little bit yeah. about it, and um, so we we came up with the idea that um, like like what you did with Glenn North in the next room, working together with a poet. And um, so, you, which of these did you? It, it was, I think the tracks, this one and this one, I think were the two, but it seemed like these two. Yeah, you sent me the photos and I looked at them. And, um, and began to come up with a, a poem for the piece. Well, I walk in here and TJ says, well, this is your room. <laughs> and I'm expecting to have about this much space with, you know, the two of us are expecting. And so I went, well, that's cool. And um, so after, uh, have you all heard of Donald Trump? No. <laughs> no. no. Um, after that idiot was elected, um, I began working on a series. I grew up in D.C. and I always wanted to do a series on the monuments. And so I began to work on that project. That would have been 2016, right? And um, that's where these came from, like the destruction of democracy and um, this one with kind of the doves and the eagles, uh, hawks and doves, and um, the Statue of Liberty with these kind of ghosts falling around it, which was about the border. Um, and so those, I thought, well, that's an invasion. That's a political, it's an insurrection. It's a, and then the last one was we still had a little space left over, and I'd done a series in 2010 on um, the um, Horizon oil spill. I'd grown up in the south along the coast and uh, made about 14 of these images of, of birds from the Audubons and then put them in kind of distressful uh, situations and with, with lots of uh, dark and... So that, that became the show that uh, TJ started and Ada, um, um, you multiplied it. <laughs> and and um, so I would like to introduce and have you, you read I your will, poem. I will read the poem and I'll put it in the context that the poem comes out of. So um, when I was much younger, <laughs> before the, like you say in Spanish, the canas came in with her hairs. I was a political science major. I literally loved history, uh, specifically military history. So I used to read a lot of military history. I used to read them. I would read stories about Waterloo. I would read about Pyrrhus, who was a great general during the, uh, that transition from where the Athens state uh, ceases to it collapses in Roman ascents, right? So Pyrrhus was the guy that was kind of trying to save the Hellenistic world. That's where we get the Pyrrhic victories. So I had all, all these stories in mind. And one of my favorite uh, places, uh, one of my favorite stories to read about was uh, Waterloo, and the great thing that happens in Waterloo. Uh, and until I, so I always was wrapped up in this idea of the glory of war, the honor and the things, right? And I found somebody gave me a regimental history of what, one of the units of the Wellington that served at Waterloo, and it talked about when uh, Ney, uh, Marshal Ney, who was the great cavalry commander of Napoleon attacks the lines uh, along uh, uh, Wellington's front, the uh, regiments basically collapse into squares. And one of the things that the 
the, under the Napoleonic Wars, it was very intense, but it carried into the Civil War, you would shoot grape shot into these formations. And literally, grape shot was just a cannon where you filled it with all these bits of iron and stuff. And when you shot it, it literally just sent out the spray. And it would literally cut people off at the legs, the arms, whatever, just totally destructive. And it was when I was reading that military history, there's a point at which they describe the injuries. And then all of a sudden, I, at that moment, I realized there's no glory in war. Uh, as Falstaff says, right, what's honor? And so I totally began to change my mind about the glorification of war. There's nothing in war, really, honestly. So this is not a pro-Ukraine, anti-Russian poem. It's really a poem just against war in general. And it, it starts off with a, a quote by Voltaire. It is forbidden to kill, therefore all murderers are punished, unless they kill in large numbers to the sound of trumpets. And so this is, and this was in relation to what uh, Hugh had put out there. And I looked at the images and I immediately thought of the um, retreat of the, Russia, of the German army from uh, Stalingrad. And you see the bodies lining the snowbanks, the roads, the railroad tracks, and literally just bodies just frozen and dead. And so this is that poem because that's what that brought me to it. Invasion. The pigeons brings tidings of another war. Refugee messages circled the blank-eyed cities. They would have been here sooner, but the cannonade buckled latitude and longitude to arbitrary nodes. Unwrap the gas, the gauze dipped lightly from the pigeon's leg, lay it flat on the table, study the contours, dark edges and lines, the sacred text of plans and the weight of metal tracks, the metronome for melodies of bleeding trumpets. Converging planes and lines defile snow-draped fields. There is nothing new to see here or there. Nothing memorializes what is readily forgotten. No monuments consecrate what was never sacred. There is no fog but a shimmering night, glimpses defining the topography of death. Edicts now gray slabs and coils of iron bar, crystallized concrete in the gleam of a cold moon. Erased bodies fertilize the hollow ground as a flag whips high above collapsed homes. Flags embalmed, embossed on caissons pulled by lone mules arrive from the cardinal directions. The sun sets again on this whirligig. You have seen them all your life. Prepare your children to see them, transparent as branches in March and April. What is new now that yesterday wasn't full of? What will be tomorrow that was not enough today? And there are two lines in here because I was really affected by a poem that was written by Yevgeny Yevtuchenko by Bobby Yar. And the line of that poem starts out, there are no monuments at Bobby Yar. And it was a place where literally over the course of the war, probably over 100,000 people were exterminated. And it's a ravine that sits there. And there's a line he talks about uh, when he's looking at that and thinking about memory, transparent as branches in April. And I just extended it to March, April, and May just for the rhythms of that and it's spring that we're looking for but it's death that we're actually talking about so that's the poem that's that yeah. <laughs> so thank you thank you